Hey guys, I'm at Camo's Reptiles today, um, a place with many, many blue tongues, so that we can talk about how to look after a blue tongue properly, which was a requested video. So I'll show you some of Camo's blue tongues and then I'll show you how to care for them. see there's a few different types of blue tongues uh, so we've got our eastern blue tongue here and we've got our blotched blue tongue here that are pretty different but the care for them is all pretty much the same so um, we'll go through how to do that and this information does also apply to shinglebacks as well um, you know anything in that sort of family but yeah here we go now this tank is four foot or 120 centimeters long and 60 centimeters or two foot deep. Now that is the floor space that I recommend where possible for blue tongues because I find in anything smaller, sometimes they climb the sides of the tank. So for instance, this is a really good option um, as a base tank that you could use. You also can get these in melamine. Um, for eastern blue tongues being kept in Sydney, you could also keep them outdoors in like a rabbit hutch or um, a little above ground veggie garden or anything like that as well. So, but there you go. So this is an example of a tank that you can use. Um, you could even do a four foot fish tank, um, but we do want to be mindful that we're setting it up correctly for the species. Now I'm gonna run through how you set up the enclosure. So if this is our 120 centimeter long tank, about in the middle, so at about 60 centimeters in from either side, we would have our UVB globe. This runs for 10 to 12 hours a day to keep their bones nice and strong, uh, keep them nice and healthy, gives them access to the same UVB rays that they would normally get from laying in the sun. Over here, we've got a, either a heat globe with a thermostat or a heat mat on one side of the tank. This gives them a hot side of the tank and a cold side of the tank with the food and water on the cold side of the tank so that we can make sure it's not evaporating, drying out, getting really gross. And of course, at least one hide on the hot side, but you can put as many hides in as you want in all different locations within the tank. This is just your bare basic minimum. So 120 centimeters or four foot, a heat mat and or globe. Any heat globe needs to be controlled by a thermostat UVB for 10 to 12 hours a day, food and water, hide any decorations, so maybe things like rocks, and substrate. Substrate on the bottom, you have a few different options. You can use an aspen bedding, wood shavings, uh, yuki mulch. There's heaps and heaps available. Since we're at Camos right now, I'll show you all of these are the different options for heat globes that you can use. Now, I personally like to use ceramic heat emitters because these emit heat without emitting any light, but a heat globe is perfectly fine. I like to use red or purple so they can run through the night uh, without waking the lizard up, but if you are a sensitive sleeper, you may want to stick to your ceramics. Um, so as you can see, Camo has these guys ranging from like $40 up. Heat globes are like from $13 up. Nice and easy. UV globes. We've got them right here, 10.0s. Um, you always want to use a 26 watt in anything over a 90 centimeter enclosure. So this is definitely one of those instances we'll use a 26 watt globe. And that's it for your globes. Now you definitely need a thermostat to control it. So as you see, Camo has those two. You can use one of these fancy ones that controls the timer of your UV light and all of that. Anything that you want to make sure that this is on for the 10 to 12 hours a day. 
Uh, if you just wanted to use a little timer from Kmart, you can definitely do that. And then your alternative to your heat lights is things like heat mats. So these would be a perfect size for a small to juvenile, even realistically an adult, as they're not a super high temperature snake uh, lizard. Or if you wanted something that the whole body would fit on, this would be it here. So really, really cool that everything is right here at Camo's. So you can set up all here. This thing is just that obviously we don't want to take up unnecessary space with unnecessary things. So like this bowl is bigger than my head definitely don't need something like this for food or water for one blue tongue. Now if you had say 30 of them in an enclosure, um, you know, or if you like camo, you've got a couple of old retirees all living together, but like this is great, but definitely not just for one. And what are they eating? Well these guys have been eating a nice, decent quality wet dog food, a canned dog food. Uh, where possible, stick more to your meat and veg ones and stay away from the, the rice ones and stuff like that. So they definitely don't need grains in their diet. It's a lot more about the meat and the veg in their diet. The higher protein they eat, the faster they grow. But also we don't want them getting super obese. So just keep an eye on that. So you can also feed them live insects. This is a super worm. It's a really good food option for these guys as they're quite slow so they need something that doesn't move too fast at all so you can see oh off you go superworms are easily available and they're a little bit safer than mealworms to feed to your loved lizards well i've got this female out this female is retired from breeding but you can see that before she came to camo she was used for breeding quite a lot in all the scars on the back of her neck be prepared that if you are breeding your blue tongue this can definitely happen the males can get a bit too aggressive when they're trying to breed the females and they can rough them up quite a bit now apart from your protein food sources of dog food uh, lean meats like kangaroo mints, um, your insects, all of that. Uh, you also need some vegetation in the diet. And so a great option for that is your dark coloured leafy greens. So your things like kale, bok choy, um, spinach, anything that's a dark leafy green. And then you can put some carrots, some mung beans, those sorts of things in the mix as well. Um, we even do some purple cabbage in the mix because the colour kind of gets their attention a little bit, I guess. Um, and yeah, they do like fruit, but it's not great for them to have heaps of it. So you could do a bit of banana every month or so. Um, just keep it to small amounts. You don't want to have a high sugar diet or they get big fatty mat, uh, lumps in their throats and stuff like that, which isn't too healthy for them. It's the same as us guys. An overweight lizard will have problems with their heart with all of their organs and stuff. So obviously we don't want that. A really great option for food for blue tongues is snails. That's what they have such strong, strong jaws for eating. So if you're able to get your hands on some snails, you can actually keep them in the fridge to keep them dormant and to make sure that they haven't been poisoned or eaten anything bad. It's a good idea to keep any food that you catch from the wild in captivity for at least a week to make sure that it's not sick or alternatively, you can buy your snails from a reputable source. This would be another option for keeping them outdoors. This is a garden bed, uh, like a raised vegetable garden. Um, now, because blue tongues aren't what's currently in it, uh, sleepers have been dug down to make it dig proof. Don't need to worry too much about being super dig proof for a blue tongue, but right now you can see it's mostly baby water dragons in here. So, hence, very large water bowl as well. But definitely an idea of how you could set up very similar for a blue tongue. Um, get some shade from either end and from the sides as well. Um, lots of hides, vegetation to attract a lot of insects and give a lot of hiding places. If I was doing this for a blue tongue, I would simply just make the water bowl a bit smaller. And that's pretty much it. Here you go, this isn't quite a blue tongue, but something else that has similar care. A baby land mullet that has just been born into camos. Right as I was about to show you how to set up these guys if they're in a pit. Something cool that you don't see all the time. 
So land mullets are kind of like the mean black cousins to the blue tongues. This pit is really cool in its construction in that there's lots of places for them to dig. Um, now the spikes are actually to try and keep cats out, not to stop the lizards from escaping. All of the fencing is done so that the lizards cannot escape, but unfortunately cats get in and they're a big drop. Now in here they are cohabitating with, that is a long neck turtle that's out of the water, a water dragon, land mullets obviously, as I just showed you, the baby land mullet in here, but yeah, they can definitely cohabitate with quite a few species. Um, a blue tongue is just down here, you can see its tail. They're scattered everywhere through here and you can see lots of places for them to hide. Now under this big dirt and rock mound, there are also pipes that they can hide in there as well. So it keeps them nice and safe at night from things like cats, uh, safe through the day from birds, um, just gives them lots of places to kind of be hiding and as well all of this vegetation draws in a lot of natural food for them, things like snails and you just need to make sure that if you're doing that you have a conversation with your neighbours about whether or not they're putting out snail baits. If you tell them that you are got blue tongues out and about that are eating all the snails they'll likely be more than happy not to put out baits so that you guys can get a good feed. Here he is, he's popped back out again. Hey buddy. So cute. This woman is very close to having some eggs too. You can see just how fat she is. Now there's do have quite a large pond in here. If this was a blue tongue only or a skink only setup, it would not need a pond quite this large with fish and stuff in it but um, the water dragons do like going for a swim and there are turtles in here too. So a much smaller water source is perfectly fine if you're not putting these species in with your blue tongues. Now in this setup is another species quite similar to blue tongues in care and that is Cunningham skinks which we have seen on my channel before in the Oberon trip video. I think that's titled 13 hours of herping. So again, you could definitely do something like this. The cool thing about this is that this concrete tunnel and some of the concrete is all heated internally so that these guys have nice hot spots. Um, and this goes through to breeding boxes where they can curl up, they can have their babies and we can get in externally from the outside here to see what's going on in there if anything goes wrong. So definitely really, really cool this setup. Um, great for the Cunningham skinks. Unfortunately, you barely see them, but that's how you know they're living their most natural life. Ooh. And you can definitely see the resemblance to the blue tongues here. So how do you know that your blue tongues are healthy? You've set them all up like that, um, but you're, you're not 100% sure that they're healthy. Well, they should have nice clear eyes, a tongue poking out nice and rapidly. Um, they should be tasting their environment a lot. Um, not blowing bubbles, not coughing, not gagging or anything like that. Um, alert, active, although blue tongues are kind of a lazy species, but eating, drinking, everything without any worries. But yeah. So I hope that's helped guys. Um, if you do have any further questions, um, I am running out of time to film today, but pop them in the comments down below and I'll see if I can help you out. All right, take care guys. I appreciate you coming to hang out, find out more about these cool animals and I'll see you on the next one.